Hello, I'm Kendall House, and welcome to Module 8 of Evolution and Human Behavior. This module is exciting because it marks the halfway point in the class, but also because we're going to discuss exciting topics, including reciprocity, which might provide a way to achieve cooperation among individuals who are not close genetic kin, Game theory, which lets us think about the outcomes of interactions between individuals. And a game that's quite famous known as the Prisoner's Dilemma, which I encourage you not to rush to assumptions on until you finish viewing all of these videos. I hope you enjoy them, and thank you for listening. This presentation is called, What is Reciprocal Altruism? In this presentation, we're going to answer three questions. First, we're going to review why altruism is puzzling. Secondly, we'll answer the question, what is reciprocal altruism? And thirdly, we'll look at some evolved psychological features that it's been proposed are the result of selection for reciprocal altruism. So if you're an altruist, what it means is that you harm your reproductive success to benefit the reproductive success of other individuals. And this is quite puzzling. How could such behaviors increase via natural selection? Because it appears that indeed uh, it's the individuals being benefited who are going to win. So the question posed by altruism is how can we possibly win by losing? How can we explain this? And a biologist named John Alcock refers to this as a Darwinian puzzle. And a Darwinian puzzle is any behavior that appears to have negative consequences for fitness. So one possible solution to this that we've looked at is Hamilton's rule. And we've argued in relation to Hamilton's rule that genetic relatedness can transform altruism into cooperation, and then we can make sense of it. We're going to look at a second solution that's been proposed. This is called reciprocal altruism. The argument here is that reciprocity can transform altruism into cooperation. And what's exciting about the focus on reciprocity is that close relatedness is not required. So it certainly is the case that reciprocity might be easier among close kin, but you can practice reciprocity with individuals who are not your kin and still achieve cooperative outcomes. So this appears to give us two roads to cooperation, one being Hamilton's rule, and a second being reciprocal altruism. Now this idea of reciprocal altruism was proposed by Robert Trivers back in 1971 in a paper titled The Evolution of Reciprocal Altruism. And as many have noted, uh, Trivers did not discover reciprocity. And indeed, an economist who worked on quite similar models well ahead of Trivers referred to reciprocity as a folk theorem because he took it to be simply part of the common sense of many human traditions. So it's not the case that Trivers invented or discovered reciprocity. What Trivers did do was put reciprocity into an evolutionary framework. He tried to develop an evolutionary explanation of reciprocity and explore the evolutionary implications of reciprocity, and that was something new. So what is reciprocity? Well, we'll use these two uh, smiley faces that we'll call blue and orange to stay with our BSU collars. And basically, blue benefits orange, for which orange says thank you so much. And then orange benefits blue uh, and gets a return thank you. So reciprocity is simply you scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. 
And hopefully, in the case of these two baboons, uh, the big baboon will reciprocate, having its back scratched. Now, reciprocal altruism is a little different. There's a little more involved in it than simple reciprocity, because what is being reciprocated is an altruistic act. So again, if we start with blue and orange, then we said that an altruistic act is when blue benefits orange. And there's a thank you for that. But the outcome of that is that blue is harmed. The reproductive fitness of blue is harmed. So what makes it altruism is that the benefit flows from blue to orange. Now the key to Triver's argument on this, to his whole model of reciprocal altruism, is that when this occurs, the harm to blue is much less than the benefit to orange. So what he's arguing here is perhaps cooperation can emerge out of reciprocated altruism when the harm is less than the benefit. So when altruism is reciprocated, it simply flows the other way. Now orange benefits blue, and blue now says thank you, but as a result of this, orange is harmed. And the key here again is that the harm to orange now has to be less than the benefit to blue. And it's when we put these two acts together, in each of which the benefit is greater than the harm, that the two individuals who've reciprocated altruism come out ahead and achieve a cooperative outcome. So the final outcome here if we remember that in the first transaction, the benefit to orange was greater than the harm to blue. And in the second transaction, the benefit to blue was greater than the harm to orange. Then when we add those together, the combined benefit is going to be greater than the harm. And both of them will end up acting in a cooperative manner where they come out ahead uh, through reciprocating altruism. So this is a way that altruism can be transformed into cooperation if Robert Trivers is correct. Now there's three critical points to make about this model of reciprocal altruism. The first is that in each transaction, the benefit to the recipient has to outweigh the harm to the altruistic donor. So you don't have reciprocal altruism unless the benefit is greater than the harm. And an altruistic situation, based on that assumption, is defined by Trivers as any situation in which one individual can dispense a benefit to a second that is greater than the cost of the act to himself. So that's just saying that the benefit has to be greater than the harm and this was quite explicit in Triver's original argument. A second critical point is that the donor's altruism must be reciprocated by the beneficiary. So if in fact I incur a reproductive cost to assist you and you never reciprocate, we don't get that cooperative result, you've exploited me, and this is terribly important to Trivers thinking on this because since there's a time divide between my act and your act, there's a possibility that you won't reciprocate. And indeed, there can be a strong temptation to cheat or not reciprocate and simply take the benefit and leave me a genuine altruist. A third critical point is that the partners in reciprocity do not need to be close genetic relatives. And this is exciting because it means that we have a model that possibly can explain cooperation beyond close genetic kin. And that matters a great deal because in fact human societies generally exceed their kin. So certainly kinship and close genetic kinship matters in human social relations, but we do a lot more than simply form social ties with close genetic kin. We also form social ties with individuals who are not our close genetic kin, 
And what Trivers was trying to do with this model was make sense of sociality that exceeds kinship. So what situations then would be conducive to reciprocal altruism? Trivers offered a fairly complex array of conditions, uh, but we're going to reduce it to a small number of simple conditions. One thing that he argued was that it would be beneficial if the organism involved had a long lifespan because this would make it possible for multiple events of reciprocity to occur over that lifespan. It would certainly help a great deal if there was a high likelihood that the individuals involved would meet each other multiple times and repeat their interactions. And it would also help if those opportunities were symmetric. And that means it's not just me continually having the opportunity to sacrifice to help you, but that you have the opportunity to sacrifice to help me. So symmetry means balanced and there needs to be this balance of need in order for reciprocal altruism to take off. Now if we consider a small human society like a foraging band, and this is a photo of some Hadza people, the Hadza are hunter-gatherers in East Africa, then it's quite likely in a small band of a dozen or two dozen people that two band members will interact repeatedly over the length of their life and it's quite likely that there'll be some symmetry in those interactions and they'll continually be able to assist one another in a reciprocal manner. So there is a plausibility to this argument in regard to the environment of evolutionary adaptation if we consider that over most of human history we've lived in very small societies. Now Trivers uh, spent about half of the paper on uh, humans and he speculated boldly on the psychology of reciprocity so this paper could, could be considered one of the founding works of evolutionary psychology and among the things he predicted would characterize our psychology based on this is first phenotypic plasticity so our phenotype is our expressed behaviors and plasticity means that those behaviors can take a number of different forms. So when you think about plastic, think about moldable, changeable, bendable. And words that support this then are contingency, that will behave reciprocally on a contingent basis. This is also called facultative reciprocity. And again, facultative means that we express it differently in different circumstances. And what Trivers is getting at with this is that sometimes we might simply choose not to reciprocate and that we're going to do the best if we calculate. Now this is quite interesting because in fact in human societies, usually people value reciprocity greatest when it doesn't appear to be calculated. But Trivers' argument is that behind that desire to appear as if we're selfless and generous, our brains are calculating whether we're aware of it or not. Another thing he connected to reciprocal altruism is the complex of friendship. And friendship is very interesting from an evolutionary perspective. But Trivers proposed that experiments that have been done to date showed that humans are more altruistic towards individuals that we like and that we tend to like individuals who are the most altruistic in their behaviors. And Trivers argued this whole complex of having friends is an expression of reciprocity. Third is a set of characteristics that he called moralistic aggression. And this is simply that giving and receiving and behaving in a reciprocal manner has a lot of emotions bound up with it. And these are often quite powerful and we attach strong moral weight to them. So one thing that motivates us to sacrifice for someone else is our sympathy for them. We expect then gratitude for that and that gratitude might be expressed in a return act of generosity. Similarly, if, if we don't help someone, we'll probably experience guilt 
And if somebody doesn't reciprocate and take care of us after we've taken care of them, we might feel a strong sense of betrayal. A fourth factor that he ended up stressing more than any others is that, there, again, there's this temptation to cheat in reciprocity, and that means there's a need for us to screen out those individuals and to recognize when they do cheat. And a result of this that Trivers predicted would be an evolutionary arms race between selection that favors our talents at deception and selection that favors our ability to uh, sort out cheaters or detect them. And Trivers went on to develop at great length an argument that first emerged in this paper that was focused on self-deception. And he recently published a book called The Folly of Fools, The Logic of Deceit and Self-Deception in Human Life. And his thesis is that the very best cheaters among humans are individuals who can deceive themselves. So as long as we know that we're deceiving other people and pretending to be generous when we're not, they can detect that. But when we genuinely deceive ourselves into thinking that we're being generous when we're not, it's much harder for them to detect. Thank you for listening.